You're tuned in to RX Radio. That's a weird thing with you. You're like the perfect mix of old school and new school. I can always tell when a guy's being filmed. He absolutely fucking hates being filmed. This plant's going to bug the fuck out of me the entire time. Love it. Yeah, to be fair, that's how we roll with it, mate. Bit of a mixture of old school and new school. That's uh, that's definitely uh, a good description, mate, to be honest. Was that a difficult thing to bridge? Like, Because I see every British bodybuilder like their own reincarnation of Dorian Yates. Like, there's no difference. There's no only time. Like, it would either be you or Jimmy or Jordan. It would, if you guys were around 30 years ago, you guys would all just be Dorian Yates. And if Dorian Yates was around today, he would just be one of you. Well, not not quite. Not quite. Not quite on that level. But I think uh, there's definitely still a big gap, especially in England, where you've got the guys that are just, you know, simple bro signs like, this, this is what you've got to do. You know, and that's how it rolls. But for me, if you want to progress, if you want to get to the next level without being a genetic elite, you need a mixture of both. Otherwise, you're just going to spin wheels. And maybe this is just an outsider's perspective, but I feel like, in, I mean, in the States, in Canada, in, you know, even in Australia to a certain degree, like, there is a clear divide at the top of those who are, you know, more critical in the way they think, more cerebral in their thought process, more maybe health driven, more systematic at the top. And then like the bro science crowd, like US, Australia, Canada, there's a pretty, you know, there's a 50 50 split from an outsider in the UK. I feel like you guys at the concentration of guys at the top seem to have it the most figured out. Like it's as if you guys just drowned out bro science with like, actual work ethic and actual science more than any other concentration of bodybuilders in the world i feel like the current state of british bodybuilding is the most formidable per capita whether from coaching or a competitor standpoint like you guys have a bit of a mount rushmore going on right now that seems to be far and above the world standard yeah i love that i love that and i definitely do agree i think especially a couple of years ago for me it came to a point where we got access to a lot more information. We got access to a lot more, a lot more data that just makes sense. So it wasn't just based off, you know, this is what he's done all these years. It was more a mix of your own research, your own mileage, and actual, you know, research that's backed by science. And I think ever since we started taking that route, where we kind of allow both to meet, you know, I think that's where we've seen the most progression across the board, whether it's myself, James, all the other guys. And it's allowed me to definitely take a step back and focus on making more progress in a way that's going to keep me intact as a bodybuilder with no injuries, first and foremost, and certainly no health issues. And I think that's, that's, that's the main objective right now, I think. The guys that are still stuck in the bro science days, they're, they're the guys that generally make the mistakes that leave them either broken in the gym or broken outside of the gym as well with the approaches they do have across the across the board. You're you're frustratingly young to have such a good perspective on all of this. Like and not because I want to get into like the the business side of things, which I think is something that you should be revered from. Like your gyms are insane and your plans are even crazier. But how long into this, because you're at a point now where, I mean, I know people that don't start bodybuilding until you're 27, 28, 27, 27, 27. Yeah. Fucking crazy. When did it, when did the tide start to shift for you? When, like, I mean, I did bro science stuff when I started and I, was able to over the course of a few years try and sort out a, a better path how quick into your bodybuilding career maybe not even career but into you training did you start to parse out sort of the week from the chaff like the good science from like the i don't know about this well when i turned 23 i think after 2017 after that to be honest during the 2017 prep when i started getting more access to you know, the better, better knowledge kind of things through the internet and started getting to speak to certain individuals that, that just knew a little bit more than others. Um, that's when a tide turned for me, especially 
after uh, in 2017 after a, a world-renowned coach, let's just say that, uh, offered me some help, and the protocols were just retarded. Like it was fucking stupid. Like if I did that shit, I would either end up dead or I would have killed someone. It was that fucking stupid. Um, and back back then, I was only 23 years old. I was doing the junior British finals back in them days. It was UK BFF where it still meant something. That was the last year. That was actually the year when James was pro card. And obviously, I was doing my own prep. And I was happy with my own prep. But obviously, this person was like, you know, trying to step in, you know, trying to help. And um, as soon as I seen the protocol sent through, I was like, fuck this shit. Um, that's obviously when I started doing a lot more of my own research as to what can I do to be better? What can I do to, you know, do things in a better way? That, that was more like a turning point for me where I realized that, there's so much more information out there that's going to allow me to be much better as a bodybuilder and as a coach. Because obviously, from a coaching standpoint as well, I was already coaching like full time for two, three years. So I started coaching really early as well with the bodybuilders. So for me, that was definitely a big turning point. And ever since then, it just got better and better just through certain things that we could actually get access to right now. Was back then, even then, like years before that, all we'd get is, you know, Muscle development magazine, and that's it. You know, would get, would get, would get nothing that we do get now. Like even your courses, like the prescript that you do now, like anyone can do that at home. Back then, there was fuck all like that, mate. There was nothing. There was nothing that we could get access to to get real knowledge through anything. What do you attribute that to? Because I think most twenty-three-year-olds, if put in that situation, where like a prominent and you're fucking telling me who this coach is after, by the way, but most twenty-three-year-olds, especially, I mean, I see it still. When, you know, they're on the come up, they get attention from bigger coaches looking to maybe latch on to like a rising star in the industry. Most 23 year olds wouldn't have the uh, the fortitude to look at it like I'm, I'm so glad you used it because this word needs a, uh, an emergence. But like would look at a retarded protocol and just be like, no, I'm not doing that rather than diving all in. Like, what do you think? What did it for you as far as like, you know being able to look at this person who could have, and this is part of it, is always like the social side of the game, right? People pick coaches because coaches know judges and judges will pick favorably. Like this is not new, this is not news. But what was it about your mindset at 23 that allowed you to look at that and be like, no, absolutely not. I'm going to go this way and dig a little bit deeper on my own. I already had a long-term plan from a younger age. So I already knew like where I want to be. And I knew like, look, I've got decent genes, yeah, but I don't have the 1% that, you know, top three Olympians have. So for me to get to where I want to be, it, it's going to take a lot more than that. So I had a long-term plan already. I saw the protocol and I thought to myself, right, if I do this, yeah, I might do well, but it's not going to be long lived. Like I'm not going to be in the game for as long as I want to be. Like. Realistically, back then, I was already thinking, like, I want to be in the game for years to come, not just for now. So for me, it was always looking at it from a longevity standpoint. And from a standpoint, like, I never just think of now. I always look into the future when it comes to certain things, obviously. So for me, it was definitely a point of realisation that if I do this now, yes, I might be better for now. But long term, it's going to it's gonna do the damage that I probably cannot cannot rectify and cannot undo by that point at 23 were you already like so you already had your mind set on like a longer term bodybuilding career was bodybuilding something that like was i mean you were already coaching at what point maybe did it become like this is going to be the way i secure my income because there's a point behind the, the background question behind all of this is anyone might look at you and be like oh he's uh uh he's out on parole he's definitely out on parole right like I just my like I, I I listen to the way you talk about business and about goal setting, and even like the learning from your mistake series. And I go, what would this guy? This has to be bodybuilding. There's no other career that can that you need this level of focus and attention to. It's either that or I don't know. Like if you were in high school, what would your what would you, what did you tell your high school guidance counselor you wanted to be when you grew up? I wanted to be a bodybuilder. Man. Okay, when won. did that start? How old were you? Oh. I was like 16. I did my first show at 16. And yeah, I did my first show at 16. At school. So it all started off with boxing, right? So anyway, long story short, 
when I was just just coming up to 16, I had a bit of fallout with my coach and I started bodybuilding. Whilst I was boxing, I was already, you know, I was already training, I was already in the gym, I was already lifting weights, and I was in I was in good shape. You know, at 15, you know, I I, I was I was in good shape and I looked like a trained. So it, it kind of the passion was always there for boxing, but I always had like a bit of an itch when I saw bodybuilders and I was like, that's how I want to be deep down. Like deep down, the passion was always, you know, about getting massive. And I was always intrigued with how you can change your body and what you can do with your own body as well. So after the fallout, I was 16. I stepped into my first real bodybuilding gym. And like six, seven months later, I did my first bodybuilding show at 16. And I was still, that was my last year at school. So when I started bodybuilding and my teachers literally said to my mum, like, he's never been interested in anything else apart from his training, even when I was boxing. So they said, like, they just gave up on me. It was like, there's nothing we can do or say that that's going to change it. Like, that's just what he wants and that's it. Like, and, and, and there's nothing that would have swayed me from that. And even I was at college, you know, it was the same story. So everything I always did was always based around bodybuilding. And long story short, obviously I started PT when I was 18. I was still, I was already doing a little bit of PT when I was 17, actually, but then I officially started doing it when I was 18. I started working doors when I was 18 as well, just to get my extra income, just so I can bodybuild without needing, you know, a real job, so to speak, that's going to hold me back from my training. Because my thought process was always around, what can I do to be, uh, to be able to live the life? What can I do to be able to be a bodybuilder? So I was working doors, I was PT in the daytime. And the breakthrough for me with my coaching and, 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 and real and bodybuilding was when I won my first major show at 21, which was the Nava Junior, Nava Junior Mr. Universe, which is, you know, one of the most prestigious junior titles you can win. For me, that was a breakthrough point because I, I managed to build myself up from that position where I think it was like three or four weeks out I didn't have to do doors anymore as I was so busy with coaching and PT already. I could just devote myself to that full time. So from that time, literally every hour of the day was devoted towards bodybuilding, towards training, towards training other people. So it was literally just that. And that was the breaking point. Um, and then after that show, my coaching just flew. And they started building up from there. And then the gym came in 2017, January 9th. And... That was when I first opened the doors to the first gym. Now, what was the learning curve on that end? Because, like, a lot of people get into it. It's funny because all my favorite, were you pro when you opened the gym? Was I pro? Yeah. No, I was, well, how old was I now? 2017. How many years ago was that? Oh, shit. I was, yes. I was, 20, I was 21, 22. It's always, it's my favorite professional bodybuilders are oftentimes, though, you're actually one of the very few of, like, the, the professional bodybuilders I follow because I use the term professional not giving an absolute flying fuck about an IFBB pro card it's a fucking library card it's a, an attribution to hard work but most of my pro bodybuilders and I actually think you're maybe the only one that actually has their pro card like being a professional means someone gives you money and IFBB usually means you need to pay them dues to have this thing. I, I honestly thought the pro card was like a big sweepstakes check. Like it was this massive thing that you could give to your mom or something and she could put over the mantle. And I'm just like, it's this, it's this tiny thing? It's, it's like a little green card, mate. <laughs> How was the learning curve of opening your own gym? That had to have been a fucking nightmare. It was hard. And the, the, the biggest the biggest real part was trusting the wrong people. That was like the biggest and, and the worst part because back then, obviously I got into business with a few other guys and especially one of them kind of sold a dream to, 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 to us and basically gave us all these fancy figures saying we're going to be earning this much. And it was just all bullshit. You know, he didn't have, he did not have a fucking clue. Um, you know, he knew just as much as us. So basically he knew fuck all. Um, but you know, regardless, the gym was in my hometown. I was, um, I wasn't, you know, I was, I was never a person that, that was hated. So I was 
pretty liked, you know, amongst many. Some people didn't like me, a bit like Marmite. Some people love me, some people, you know, don't. But, you know, anyway, we made the gym a success. But the biggest learning curve really was not to trust the right, not to trust certain individuals. Like you have to really take your time and vet people at times because, you know, it was definitely a massive roller coaster. Like we did not have a clue what we was doing. Like I had a few contacts with gym equipment and that was a ball ache. Like we had a very limited budget as well. And, you know, the, the gym that we actually initially opened opened with, the budget was was pretty fucking small and the, the facility was already quite big. So a lot of the work we had to do was like done through all my friends. But well, it was definitely a bit of a roller coaster, to be honest. It was hard to get it going. And then it really did turn out quite, quite a decent success. But it, it did take a lot of work. It did take a lot of work. And that was the actual year where I didn't actually compete. Was it 2016? It was actually 2016 when I started building the gym. Um, yeah, 2016, I started building the gym. And that was the year when I was 21 turning 22. Um, and that was literally just about towards that. I was still bodybuilding. I was still, you know, focused on business. I had a lot of people competing that year. So it was a bit of a magic year for me. And the biggest learning curve was really is the discipline and just slogging it out. Like, you know, for me, no matter how bad shit it gets, you know, you've just got to keep going because a lot of times I could have just gave up and be like, fuck this. Because, you know, there was a lot of pressure, which that's the one thing I never really feel anymore. Like, I never feel pressure from anything because of, like, the, the process that I've been through have almost got me to a point where it's like, no matter what happens, I can just keep going. I don't really feel pressured because I just know that you know, if I just take one day at a time, no matter what it is, I can just get it done. When were you able to start doing both simultaneously again? Like if that year was building the gym, still training like a bodybuilder, when did it kind of get to a point where it's like the gym is stable? You're now like, okay, you know, because I feel like watching as just a fan, you're never because it's like the second you get comfortable you're like i know i'm gonna open another gym it's like kuba fuck man live off the interest dude like what are you doing so i think first thing you need to mention it's like for me it's never like reaching a goal like reaching goal means nothing like when i'm more like i'll give you an example right when when i'm on a pro card it, it's gonna sound weird it's gonna sound odd it meant nothing when i opened the gym right? It was my childhood dream to, to own a gym. When I actually opened the doors, I felt nothing. But the only time I actually felt something was leaning up to it when I was putting the work towards it. Does that make sense? Yeah, dude, I, 100%. It's never, yeah, I it's get never it. really, it's never really about achieving the goal. It's about what I'm doing to get there. Same with prep. Like, competing means nothing to me. Like, I step on stage, but that's, I don't feel anything. But what means something to me is the prep. Like, what am I doing to get better? Say, and this is this is the reason why I, you know I'm okay with the bodybuilding side because it's the same off season. People don't like off season because they're not competing because they just like competing. I don't fucking like competing. I like bodybuilding. I like progress. I like moving forward. And it was the same with the gym. So, was building gym through 2016 started. I think that the work started in like September. We opened the doors September, October, yeah. Um, we opened the doors January 9th, 2017. And that was when, that was the year when I was like, right, I'm getting back on fucking stage. And that year, I'll, I'll tell you another story, man. You'll fucking, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll never, I'll, like, this is the first podcast I actually spoke about it. So I'll speak about it on here, yeah. So 2017 was the year when, uh, when I got back on stage. And 2017 was, was the year when we opened the gym. And uh, that was my last year as a junior in UKBFF because I was turning 23 that year. So I thought, right, I'm going to get in shape, do the show in July, which was the least qualifier for British finals, which was like September or whatever it was. So I did a qualifier and I, I got in pretty decent shape. I was like 100 kilo on stage, but I was you know, still quite far off. But I was big for a junior, so I smoked them. Um, I think that was six or seven weeks out from the finals I had left. Four weeks after, there was another qualifier at Leicester. So I did a headweight class. By then, I came down to like 96 kilo. I was in very good shape. I was lean and actually won the heavyweights. 
So that was like another like, right, I won the heavyweight. So does that mean I can do both classes at, at finals? The judge went, well, yeah, you've qualified in both. So you can do both as a, you know, as a separate competitor. So, you know, I was like, right, get my stuff back into the prep. And I got, I got into a bit of trouble, like around here, it's a little bit clicky. Um, you know, you've got, you've got some, you know, rude boys around Sheffield and all that. But anyway, I got into a bit of trouble uh, for my own stupid doing. Um, I, I was young, I was an ego stupid, you know, I, I should have never got, you know, into trouble, but I did uh, with, with certain individuals um, and I ended up getting stabbed at three weeks out from a comp. Um, so, yeah, uh, and then, you know, I cracked on while well, prep. Yeah, I got stabbed on like Friday, Friday afternoon. Um, Saturday morning, I was back on Stairmaster doing my cardio. I didn't eat anything up plan. Sunday, I was training pull with, with stitches in my arm. I was bleeding all over the gym and I was training pull. Um, so anyway, I, managed, I still managed to do the show. I didn't really tell anyone. Um, I pretty much, you know, wasn't able to train my left arm that much. I was able to do a little bit because obviously I had stitches in it. So my left arm was slightly smaller than my right, but that wasn't really an issue. Um, but anyway, I did the show in 2017, and then I won both juniors and heavyweights. But James Hollins then obviously won his pro card that year, which was fucking amazing. Um, but yeah, like for me, it, it's never really about the goal. It's always about the journey. Like the shit that I've had in past and, and like the shit I've had pop up, whether it was in prep, whether it was just in personal life, like it's molded me into a person where no matter what can happen, mate, if I've got my eyes on something, I'll just fucking continue grinding. I'll continue going and I'll, I'll, I'll do it, whatever it is. When did the awareness, because I think it's like, I think a lot of, not a lot of people, I think it's actually really rare, but there are successful people seem to be like that, where it's like they open the gym to their childhood dream and it's just like, wah, wah, wah. When did the awareness around it not being about the goal set in? Because I think I know a lot of people personally who get like that and and get frustrated with it because they think they chase things that are going to make them happy and they don't like they get the new whip or they get you know they get the new the new house or the new rolly and it's just kind of like it falls flat so but they don't have an awareness of what actually makes them happy is the process was it ever a point where you were like you know you were fucking kicking goals and you were sitting there being like oh what the fuck I'm not happy before you started to realize that it was like, oh, it's actually the process. Like, were you always, were you always aware that when the gym door opened the first day that you weren't going to be happy? Or was that a bit of like a, like you sat scratching your head going, wait a minute. Like I thought this was everything I wanted. So I think back then it was more like realization that I just thought I was an immature little kid, you know, that just didn't really appreciate what he has. But I had the world of like, you know, working for it. But, um, the realization came of how I truly am was after a conversation with a business partner. Um, I think we had a conversation last year when we actually spoke about goals and like what we do and how we do. My business partner, Charles Martin, like he's extremely successful. Like he is, like he is next level successful. And it came to a realization when I had a conversation with him just about how we are. And like, I, I do like mentoring sessions with him, right? So, he asked me all about my goals, like, and then it, it came up in the conversation with him that day. Um, and I was like, I, thought, I was thinking about what he was telling me. I was like, actually, like, none of it makes me happy. And it's almost as if, like, nothing ever will make me happy. Like, I'm always, like, semi-happy whilst I'm in the process, but I'm never truly content with anything. Yeah. Which is pretty fucking sad. But I mean, how consistent is that with bodybuilding as a as a lifestyle and as a vocation, as a sport, as a job, right? Like, it's it's the sport that's built around indefinitive success. Yeah. So I think if not bodybuilding, I would legit probably be a crackhead. Mm. That's that's legit because bodybuilding gives me that little kick on a daily basis, knowing I can do something different, I can achieve a certain goal. I can lift better. I can, you know, I can improve. I've got an off season. I've got a prep. There's certain movements I can work on. Like there's, there's always something new I can learn. Like if I didn't have that in my life, I would be fucked. I, I, you know, if I wouldn't be in a good place. I would like, I need, I, I need something serious to focus on. That's going to keep me occupied 24 seven 
and he's going to give me a similar structure and goal setting that that, that bodybuilding will. Well, fortunately, I'm not really that interested in anything else apart from training and bodybuilding. So, you know, I don't think anything can really replace that. How do you deal with, because I would imagine, you know, you coach so many people, you've coached so many people. How do you deal with variability in mindset around that? Like not to say, you know, people do bodybuilding for different reasons. How is it that you deal with clients that don't have that? Like I would imagine you started with this luscious head of hair and you just ripped your hair out dealing with people's bullshit excuses. Oh man, that's a fucking hard one to be honest. That's a hard did I, one. Did I strike a nerve this morning? Like, did you just get off a call with yeah, like a client? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Do you know what? Like back in the day, I used to be able to nurture people a lot. I used to be able to almost like build them up. But right now, like I specifically say, I want to work with people that fucking want it. If you don't want it, there's other coaches that work for me under my brand that you can work with. For lifestyle coaches, I can work with Meg. Like Meg's a fantastic coach, but she's specific. She met Meg. Meg actually used to be a teacher, so she's great at nurturing people. So she's great at these individuals that you know need that. But for me, I find it hard to deal with right now. Uh, for me, it's more of a conversation like, look, like you either sort your shit out or you're done because you know that's not how it rolls. Like if you truly want this. There should be nothing really stepping in your way because I can't really relate to that. And the deeper I get into the coaching, the deeper I get into my bodybuilding, like I can't relate to people that aren't all in with this shit. But the ones that are all in, it doesn't feel like work for me. This is why I love it. This is why I still do it. Like it's just so hard for me at the moment to to be able to relate to these people because I just feel like when I get these individuals, I've got nothing in common with them anymore. Because the deeper I get into my process, the more like locked in I am into what I do. Yeah, yeah, that makes that makes sense. But there was a point in which you weren't, you didn't feel as deep where you could maybe connect with them. Because I, I mean, the guy who gets yeah. the guy who gets shivved on a Friday and is on the stairmaster on a Saturday probably doesn't have much relatability with anyone else in the yeah. world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I think. Again, the turning point was like when I was when I turned twenty three. When I started, you know, winning decent shows, that is when like my whole mindset just turned. My discipline, you know, went a little bit higher, and that is when like I realized like, you know, this is this is what I want. I'm going all in with everything. And before that, before that, I wasn't quite, I wasn't quite as committed. I wasn't quite as as super on it as I was. Like, don't get me wrong, I was always there. But I was still more of a, a kid that used to, you know, still like a bit of festivals, like to, you know, do this and that. But, you know, I wasn't quite as I am right now. Does that make sense? I was yeah. almost like at a level. I always say this, right? When people come to when people come to work with me as well, it's like it's like a stepping stone. You can't reach the level that I'm at, for example, with my commitment without being up here. So it's almost like you build yourself up towards it. And the higher you get, the more locked in you get. The higher you get, the more disciplined you get. The higher you get, the stronger your mindset gets. Do you feel like you'll look back at yourself in five years the way you look back at yourself when you were 23 or pre-23? Like, do you feel like five years from now, four years from now, you'll look back and be like, you know, I wasn't really that dedicated? Do you feel like that trend will just continue? Like you're only going to get more disciplined, more structured, that you'll look back on this conversation as like a, a moment in time and be like, this guy doesn't have any idea. I don't know. There's not much, but there's not there's not much more like regimen and structure you can get. To be honest, like every single day is literally like clockwork right now. So what struck up the conversation for this podcast was you had put up your morning, and it was like client check in six to eight, and then uh, like meal one, study for like two hours, and then go train. And I was just like, that's my guy right there. Yeah, every day is the same, man. Every day is the same. I've got allocated time for everything. So right now, my day starts at pretty much quarter past five. So quarter past five, I'm jumping out of bed. First things first, take my pictures, get my check-in done, weigh myself, have my morning supplements, get a straight work phone, start doing check-ins, get my treadmill, 20 minutes of treadmill, take the dog out 15 minutes, get back, get on the computer, get 30 minutes check-ins done, downstairs, meal of one, back to work two and a half hours, meal two, 
10 minute walk again straight after meal two. And then my work's pretty much wrapped up by 11 o'clock. Then 11 o'clock till 12, I generally dig into either. I'm going from John Jewett's university at the moment. That's really, really cool. Um, that's really cool. So I'm going through that at the moment. But generally, that that's how the day looks every single day, you know. And then on the weekends, I don't actually check in. So on weekends, you know, if there's any other bits that I need to do, whether it's podcasts, whether it's other shit, um, I do that generally. So like today, I've got a podcast for yourself at 12. And then um, I've got like an online seminar at four o'clock um, on pet escalation as well. So, you know, that that's pretty much how my days are structured. But the thing is, Jordan, like, I have conversations with people that are like, do you not feel like you'll get burnt out? I'm like, how the fuck can I get burnt out doing the shit that actually gives me happiness? Like, how? Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm doing this because I fucking like it. Like, I'm not doing this because I'm forced to do it. If I didn't like it, I'd be doing other shit. I'd be fucking fishing or doing whatever. Yeah. You know, so that's pretty much how my days look. And do you know what, Jordan? I'm like, in the past, the only thing that let me down was my structured routine. I wasn't as regimented. I wasn't as structured in my days. And I feel like that's what lacked a lot of productivity. Like, I, I will never live a different way again. Like, my bedtime is fucking quarter past nine, half past nine, don't matter fucking what. Like, I'm getting married with Meg, 11 for the seven this year. And I'm telling you now, day of my fucking wedding, I will be in bed at half past nine, probably smashing her. But then, you know, we will be going to, we will be going to sleep. Like, I will not be entertaining anyone past my fucking time, you know. So, and, and you know what, like, I'm happy, I'm much happier living like this as well. Because the only time I used to get down, I used to feel like shit, like, personally, like, inside, I used to feel like shit, was when my days wasn't as regimented, when I wasn't as disciplined, when I wasn't doing so much shit. Like, the only time I'm unhappy is when I'm not cracking on with shit. That's the only time when I'm miserable. What, and maybe the answer is it never happens, but like, I mean, I'm somewhat of an early riser myself, but like, what do you do? Do you have days when the alarm clock goes off at quarter quarter after five and you're just like, fuck? Bro, every off season. Really? When you get heavy, man, it's hard. It's fucking hard when you get heavy. I've never been not heavy. I've never been in shape. My whole life, my whole it's like I'm Bane. It's like I was born in the darkness. You've only adopted it for an off season. I've been fat this entire time. Well, like as soon as you drag your ass out of bed, like for me, as soon as I drag my ass out of bed, I'm good to go. It's just it might take me a little bit longer to get going sometimes, you know. Are or, you a negative self talk or a positive self talk guy? Negative, no, because that just drag me down. Really? Like, if I have hard, if I have, if I have a hard day, like other day, you know, prep, I'm five weeks out. I had a bit of a hard day, but like, I got in my garage. I've got a little cardio room in my garage, and I just thought to myself, like, shut the fuck up. Like, you're privileged to do this. Like, you're lucky to be able to fucking live your dream because that's what I'm doing right now. Like, I'm fucking living my dream. So, like, no matter how hard this fucking shit gets, like, I am gonna fucking embrace it because. It's not going to last forever. Like, I'm not going to be competing forever. So I better fucking cherish every day of doing what I do. I'm going to I'm gonna bodybuild forever. But fact of the matter is, I'm not going to be a competitive bodybuilder for the rest of my life. You know, it, it's, it's short-lived. You know, I might compete for the next fucking 10, 12, 13 years. But, you know, relatively, generally, when you get after 40, you start going downhill. And, you know, I've already said it. When I start going downhill, that's when I stop competing. Yeah, it's a good word. Uh, the number of times in a day that I call myself a pussy and then do something I didn't want to do. That's that's what gets me. That's my negative self-talk in the morning. It's like 5, yeah. 6, hey, listen, like, that's, not like it. that's not like it. That's not like your self-talk. No? That's oh, okay. All right. We're on the same page then. Like even between sets. Now, and now it's it's changed over the years where it's like I used to kind of be hyped and now I'm just like, don't be a bitch. Yeah. Like that's kind of where I'm at because it's, it's, it's odd and you've – you you're you're a bit of a renaissance man like i especially during i remember particularly during lockdown you were posting videos like walking your dog and you put on i even wore the old geezer joints just for you because i'm like oh fuck maybe he's gonna wear his glasses and we'll wear our glasses together but like you have somewhat of like a a, a cerebral thought process like you're not so uh, ben prokolski is in town and we're gonna train a little bit later today he's too far 
he's fucking crazy. Like, he's way too, like, I'm going to go barefoot and all this crunchy granola shit. Where you got a little bit of that spice in there. Like, you got a little bit of that, like, I don't know. You have, like, somewhat of, like, a hippie, not a hippie mindset, but it definitely one of the things that really drew me into your thought process was you were walking your dogs in a forest and you were kind of talking about, like, perspective and COVID and all this stuff. And I was like, no fucking way. Like, this guy who, now I know that you've been stabbed. It's because you look like a guy who would have been stabbed. It's like, that is such a, it's such a weird package to see. Like, how much, how much time do you devote to that side of things? Like, are there books that you read? Are there, like, meditations that you do? How much time do you have allocated in that day understanding, like, hey, you know, there's, in order to push this thing along, I might have to take a half second or I might have to take a half step back. What was my life in order to like keep going? Like, what, what, what's the question? Like, oh, what, my question is like, how, do you allocate time for you? Like, all the they, hours in the day seem not that like you know training isn't time for you, but like, do you do you do you allocate time for nothing? Nothing. No, that that's the only time I'm fucking miserable when I'm doing nothing. Really? Yeah. Like when I do nothing, that's when I'm miserable. Like if I'm doing something, I'm happy. If I'm just sat there bored or doing nothing, like literally nothing, I'm I'm not happy. Like read like would would reading a book or something like that count? Like I think nothing. Like reading a book to me is like doing nothing. Yeah. So yeah. So like listening, I I prefer audio audio cast okay. to be honest. I do that every day anyway. So that's like my study time. So my study time, that's like I think I get I, I understand what you mean. Now. I understand what you mean now. So like my study time. Obviously, learning about the shit that I love, that's my time. Uh, that's, you know, that's my downtime almost. But what's the breadth of topics? Like, you're you're too, you think too broadly to just be sitting around listening to John Jewett talk about John Jewett things. Like, dr drug deployment and crazy biochemistry John shit. Yeah. But, like, I what do you listen to? Like, what do you listen to outside of fitness and training? Outside of fitness and training? Yeah, like outside of all the meat-headed stuff, all the bodybuilding, you have to listen. Like you have to be listening to a book that has – your businesses are too successful. Your brand is too strong. You seem to have too level of a head to just be sitting there listening to deep endocrinology by John Jewett. Like what's in your previous read books that you've just ripped through? Not books. It's people around me. Is it? Okay. Talk about it. Who? Yeah, my business partners, definitely my business partners. And I think it's more like people around me for sure that, that have taught me a lot of things and the experience that I've had. It's definitely not books. Like I, I've listened to a lot of books that, that Charlie has actually recommended. Um, I think one of them was Ray Dalio. I'm not sure if you know it, but that was just about his business. And that was pretty cool. It's called Principles. That's one of that's one of my favorites because I can definitely relate to it a lot. Obviously relate to it in a way that he kind of conducts himself and the way he is. But for me, the way I am is more, it, it's more down to the environment that I've been in and the experience that I've had and the people that I've had around me. It's not necessarily that I've read something and that's, you know, that's me or, you know, that's not, that's not the case. It's more like learning from other individuals and almost absorbing all the good from them in a way. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it's such a rare answer, right? Because I think a lot of people pass off their own wisdom as something they just read in a book rather than like experience. Nah, it's, it, it's, I feel like I'm more molded into who I am through the shit that I've been through and through the people that I had around me. Would you say you're relatively like an introvert or an extrovert? Like, does being around people make you tired or give you energy? Depends what it is. Okay, fair. That's a good answer. That's a really good answer. Depends who it is. Some people drain me. That's why I can only be around certain individuals. And some people, like, I'm always uplifted. Yeah. This is why, like, I don't really spend too much time with too many different people. Yeah. Um, you know, it's certain individuals that I'm around, like, I can be around them all fucking day. But there's certain people I'm around and I'm, like, five minutes in and I've got to go. Yeah. So what are the goals now? What are the goals? Yeah, like what are the things I heard you recently talk about that five gyms, twenty properties. Yeah. What are that's the goals? The goal. What's that's that? the goal by time I'm, that's the goal by time I'm thirty. So I'm thirty one and just real quick, fuck you. 
I'm just, I'm just playing. But like, uh, what? So what does that look like on the day to day? Like taking action steps towards that in a yeah. domain where you know, like you obviously know bodybuilding, you obviously know nutrition and contest prep because you've been you know immersed in that life since you you know stepped away from boxing as a 16 year old. And you understand the day to day processes of like fucking slogging it five weeks out, sitting yourself aside, being like, look, bitch, like you're lucky to be able to do this. And you know, and you've walked that path so many times, but what's the, what's the day to day in achieving those goals? Like that seems, those are so, for anyone who's ever, you know, opened a facility, anyone who's ever like acquired property, it's like those are lofty for you're the monopoly man. I'm just gonna get you a little fucking steel car and a Scotty dog. Like that's insane. What are your day to day habits, things that you have to do to push towards those goals? Routine, discipline and consistency. Like I've gotta do what I've gotta do on a daily basis, which is what I've been doing the past year. Wake up early, get the fucking shit done, get the work done and just keep grinding every single day. Like People ask me, like, why do you not go out? Why do you not do this shit? Why do you not do that? One, I don't fucking want to. Two, I've got goals. Three, you know, if I go out, I can't stick to my routine. I can't get my work done. I can't get my normal schedule done that I've got set out. So this is the shit that, you know, I've got to do. So for me, to achieve these goals, it's literally putting one foot in front of the other, making sure that, one, my coaching business continues growing with the people that I've got working for me and it continues growing with the individuals that I want to work with Two, the gym continues growing, which it has been. Three, the second gym, you know, opens up, which it will, um, which it will January, February time, hopefully, latest. That'll be a big one. So if I can continue doing what I'm doing right now and keep on chipping away and working towards these, it's going to happen. It's just a case of time. Yeah. And it's just a case of making sure that, you know, I stay meticulous with what I do on a daily basis because right now, I can still manage it easily, be happy, not really feel like I'm working and be able to bodybuild and live my dream on a daily basis and still be able to do the shit that I need to do. Do you ever get impatient? <sighs> a little bit sometimes, yeah. Because that's sometimes. a tough one, right? Because like, if you know that it's all in the process, you know if the end goal isn't really going to make you happy, but yet you're still sitting there just going like, oh. Like waiting for emails back to me is one of the most frustrating things in the world. Because I email people back and like it's a bodily function. So for me, the, the, the most frustrating thing is, is with the gym business because right now all we're waiting for is this family to basically buy someone out of the business and then we can get the lease done and sorted so we can start cracking on the gym. And it's like, it's been dragging on for like three, four months now. So we're like, hello, like, you know, what's going on because like both myself charlie and mike business partners we're like we're ready to go like we're ready to you know everything's planned equipment's planned you know setups planned so we are like literally just ready to step in we've got the crew ready to you know go in and get the works done so the turnaround is not even going to be that long but it's just waiting game to get everything kind of organized and set with the lease agreements as well how do you deal with like how do you deal with being in situations inevitably where you're not in control, understanding that so much of your life has been built around. Like to me, it's the question between adaptation and optimization where it's like, you know, if you get very good at optimize, you learn the skill of adaptation. So like if you can control your entire surroundings up at 515, you know, walk, supplement, cardio, meal one, work, study, you know, hour 11, 12, and then all of a sudden it's like other people aren't on that wavelength. Like how do you, how do you, how do you find peace with it? How do you find serenity? How do you keep yourself busy? Like, what do you do? Because I get extremely frustrated. Like, I'd be like, oh, so there's a family that needs to do something. It's like, what if we killed everyone in the family? Would that speed things up quick? Can I just go burn their house down? Yeah. The other day I, this, I had a similar conversation last night with my girlfriend. I'm like, uh, yeah, no, I, I, uh, $2,000 and this problem goes away. She's like, what? It's like, uh, there's a Hell's Angels. It's fine. We'll take care of it. I was like, we're either going to have this conversation and, or we're going to get something like, or we're not like, we're going to talk about it. I'm going to have a problem in a solution. Like, how do you deal with, I don't know. There's so many questions that spin off this. Cause I feel like you're just a better version of me. So I'm just out of my own curiosity. Cause it's like, how do you deal with cases where things are out of your control and from like maybe a business sense, but how do you deal with like, how do you deal with other people's emotion? That's maybe a second question. 
I, I don't even think about it now. I literally, I don't give it time of day because if I did, I would end up boiling up every single day. So I just focus on the shit that's right in front of me, what I can control, what I can do about it. As long as I can, you know, do what I need to do, I'll just crack on because if the more I think about other people and what they can and can't do, the worse, you know, the worse it gets for me. So for me, it's like, right, this geezer's taking a piss. So I'll just let my business partner deal with it. He's very, he's, uh, he's very good with pestering people and getting them to, you know, move forward. So it's more like delegation with stuff like that. I don't really, for me, if I was dealing with that, I would be very impatient. It would not be my forte. So I leave that to people that, you know, know how to deal with it because that's just not me. Now, there must have been a point where you didn't have that luxury though, right? Like there must have been a point where, you know, you've grown yourself to be like a, a trustworthy business partner, someone with like a, you know, a, a proven proof of concept. There had to have been days, and this is the hard intersection I find, is like those days where you're met with these these times where uh, the, you can't delegate. There was a lot of fallouts. There was a lot of fallouts, and there was a lot of arguments. A lot of arguments. For the better, though. Hey. Like, for the better, like, any regrets around that? Would you have handled anything differently understanding where you are now? Um, I would have probably took it from a different approach. <laughs> I, I would not have got as fire. I would not have got it as guns blazing. I would have probably remained a little bit calmer, to be honest, in certain situations. Um, and a little bit more professional as well. I would have definitely remained more professional. Oh, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall for that. It wasn't pretty. Oh, uh, in a short list of people that I would be absolutely terrified to see pissed off. Like you're very high up that list. The yeah. fact too, I had no idea you had a boxing background. The fact that you can also throw hands is infinitely more because bodybuilders look big and scary. Like Frank McGrath is probably oh he's fucking way too early for Frank, but he saunters around this place like he owns it because he does own part of it. And he's got the throat blasted now. He's got the hands covered. He's got all the tattoos. Soft as baby shit. Frank yeah. McGrath is like the, he'd be the one guy I want to meet in a dark alley. You? That, that's what, one thing I'll do when I, when I retire from bodybuilding, I'll definitely fight again. Really? Yeah, 100%. 100%. Interesting. Because. Why, why do you know well, that so, so forthrightly? Because I, I'll need something competitive. Even when I'm done with competitive bodybuilding, I'll need to do something competitive. 100%. Do you ever think business will be that? I feel like you're in a really interesting place where, nah. no, nah. five not, gyms, twenty properties. Business isn't competitive. It's just you just do it. It's like it's not as if you know you're challenging someone. It, you're not. You're not. You're not challenging yourself in business. You just you just do it. It's a byproduct of your work. So business, what you achieve in business, it's a byproduct of your daily grind. It's not really you know you're not challenging yourself truly. Or you're, such, not challenging, you're not challenging another person either. That's such an interesting perspective because I find, I find more challenge in the business side of things than I think I find in anything else. Like it's the most difficult thing for me to overcome. Like achieving something in business, albeit like I'm very similar to you, like when something gets built or something gets done, I'm like, oh, that didn't really do it, did it? All right, back to work. But with, if with, my business, with my business though, it's a little bit different because – for me, the way it's always worked is the better I do at bodybuilding, the more knowledgeable I get. The better I do at competing, the better my business does. So the better I do, the better my coaching does. The better I do, the better my gym does. So it's all literally a byproduct of doing what I'm doing. So it's it's a little bit different for me. So the, the business pursuits would never take that, never scratch that itch? No, I don't think so, no. It's it's something that I don't know. For me, I'm so bad at it that it's like it's. Such I don't a... need much. Like I don't need much to be happy. Like the business goals are there, but the business goals are there really, off the influence of the business partners. Yeah. Like I, I I never really even thought about that shit until I started having mentoring sessions with Charlie. Like it's Charlie that's more engraved that shit into me. Where like you know this is what we need to do. Let's fucking get after it. Let's keep working. So there'd be no like big purchase or anything. There'd be no like other than like obviously the gyms and equipment and like your know, properties. But there's no like you're not gonna rock up in like an Austin Martin or anything like that. Uh, like you like your toys? 
maybe I'll, I'll i'll we'll see that that's that's more of a conversation of the line isn't it but one day one day i'll i'll, I'll maybe i'll have a i'll have a decent one yeah maybe maybe like my business partner's got a rolls royce with reg plate ufx one oh he's living well yeah he's got a phantom he's got a he's got a ferrari he's got He's got loads, mate. He's got he's got quite a few. Yeah. See, yeah. that's tough for me. Like I thought I was someone who didn't need much until I was around people who had a lot. And then I'm just like, oh, what's what's this over here? He's what got his own this? driver. He's got his own driver. Shut the fuck up. How'd you yeah. find this guy? Yeah. To be honest, mate, I, I I've known Mike, which is obviously my own business partner for years. Um, and I first met Charlie in twenty seventeen at the Ultraplex gym. Um and it just went on from there. We, uh, I went back in. It was Meg's birthday. I was in Leeds, training at Leeds Gym. And obviously, I had my gym already opened. And Mike was like, how's you doing? Because a lot of their members used to come to my gym on weekends because Leeds and Rotherham is like 45-minute drive. So a lot of their members used to come to my gym at weekends. So they're not of my gym because they know some of the members go. But how's Jim going and all that? We had a conversation, and then we ended up getting into business because they basically gave me an offer. was like, right, you're going to partnership with us. And this is what we're going to do with the gym. I was like, fuck yeah, let's fucking do it. Uh, you know, well, let's do it. So, but it's probably been the best thing that could have happened to me because from a business standpoint, working with Charlie and Mike, it definitely put me on the right path and it showed me how to be a mature businessman, how to act in business. It showed me a lot of ways of how I need to present myself, how I need to conduct myself in many ways as well. So, my life could have gone down a different path if I didn't meet them. It could have gone, you know, down a way different path than if I didn't meet them. So it's definitely, it's definitely been a good turning point. And like I said, I always say this, you are your own product of your environment. You know, for me, like I said, like I said to you, it's never been about books. It's always been around the people that I've, I surround myself with. And the, the smaller my circle got and the better my circle got, the better I got, the more driven I've got, the more motivated I've got, the more disciplined I've got the more mature I've got, the smarter I've got. You know, I'm still thick, but, you know, you know how it is. It, it, I'm still, it's still getting better. So it, it's it's one of them things. And you got show, you said, five weeks? Yeah. What's the show? Arnold's UK. Not the real Arnold. It's like a fake Arnold. Small it's fake Arnold. I, man, I don't know. Don't, don't, no, no. You guys are bringing the fucking smoke, man. I remember uh, Regan went out last year and he did uh, Romania yeah. He did, and then Jimmy fucking ate his lunch in the in, in front of the home crowd in in the UK. I I honestly think per capita, per concentrated four hour drive, there is no better bodybuilding scene in the world right now. Like we're we're unique here. Obviously, you got Regan, you got Q, you yeah. got AV, you got Dorian, like right down the hall. I, but, I need to come over, man. I, I need I definitely need to visit. I need gotta to visit. do this in person, man. You got to, there's a seat right there with your name on it. Um, yeah, when things, are, I don't know what the travel situation is right now, but if you're uh, obviously like doors wide open when you do get the chance, but I, I think, and that's such a fucking British thing to do where you guys just like, well, you know, we're just going to be over here and like you, you're kind of self-deprecating. Yeah. It's like part of the wit and it's like then you cunt show up and you're all fucking ja and you're like, God damn it, man. Like they said they were just, oh, I'm just going to do this little show. You've never heard of it. It's called the Arnold's. It's the UK Arnold's. And then you guys come over here and you just are fucking crushing it, man. <laughs> but I think much to your point about product or your environment, right? Like the, the camaraderie between – and I, I could just be an ignorant outsider. And I think this is what I love about the British bodybuilding scene the most is – that everyone is in each other's corner, right? Like, you know, I've, I've had the, you know, the privilege to meet and, and hang out with Oscar a handful of times. Obviously, uh, you know, JP doing what he's doing, been connected with you over the last couple of years, was able to work with Lou and Jimmy down at King's. It's yeah. like there's so much support internally where over here, and maybe because I'm too close to it, there seems like there's so much infighting. Like you guys are all like you guys all have each other's backs. You guys all, you know, you guys seem to train together. You guys make trips to to meet up. Like I don't know, it's it's a really admirable thing. And and much to your point about like the environment, it's you guys seem to have have sorted that out better than than any other bodybuilding community in the world. I think. To me, I think it comes down to insecurity. Like we're all confident in what we are doing. 
Like, we are arguably all at different levels. Like, Jimmy, you know, he's at the top. We are all chasing James, but that doesn't mean we wish him, we don't wish him the best. Like, if we can help him, we always will. Like, James knows that. Like, I message James every week, and I'm like, you know, dude, I hope everything's going well. Like, if there's anything I can do, always let me know, and vice versa. Same with, you know, James Joel. It was actually me who introduced Jamie to uh, Jordan. And, and, you know, so that was how how the kind of sponsorship went on um, through that introduction. So, you know, it's for us, if we can help each other to be better, we absolutely fucking will. Because there's no animosity, there's no jealousy, there's no there's no insecurity. Like we are all confident in our own ability of doing what we are doing at our own level. And we all know, like, in time we'll be there. Do you know what I mean? Like James is far further further ahead of us than 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 you know than we are right now. But that doesn't mean we're not gonna get there. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. I mean it's 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 such a it's I don't know, mature is the right word, but it's 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 a refreshing mindset in in an industry that seems to be built off of scarcity. Right? The yeah. scarcity mindset of you know what I think people in general though, because you get it in business, like if if people certain individuals, right? If they see someone doing better than, than them, they'll be like, Oh fuck you, he's a cunt. Like with me, if I see someone doing better, I'm happy for them. Like it, it drives me, it motivates me by by seeing others do well. But that's just the way I am. Like, I think that's a trait that everyone has or doesn't have. If you are that way inclined where you are going to be jealous of others, I think that's down to your own character and that's down to the lack of your own work ethic because straight away, to me, all that speaks is, you know, I can't do what you're doing. This is why I'm jealous of you or, I'm, you know, I wish you wrong or whatever. Yeah, and the divide between those two different mental archetypes is so wide because of social media because you can see exactly what everyone's doing you can always be looking through the neighbor's window so to speak like trying to keep up with the joneses and but to me it's it seems so inherent and maybe this is like a divide in social media but like and not to go off too long of a tangent but you remember roger bannister the american runner when he ran the four minute mile next weekend everyone it was like the insurmountable feat of human performance. No one could ever eclipse a four minute mile. And he ran like a three, five, eight. And the next weekend, four dudes like ran a, ran a sub four minute. And it's like, that's when I look at success. And when I'm around like, you know, Dorian and, and all these guys who are wildly successful, it just tells me that it's possible, which is super motivating. And I think of that Roger Bannister. I mean, that existed in a time where there was no social media. But I feel like the fr- the frequency and the pitch and the magnitude of that that voyeurism through someone else's window has really kind of taken a taken a turn on people's ability to draw motivation from that experience and draw like what's possible from that experience, and it's just sort of mutated into a, like a negative thought process and harboring animosity towards other people. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think that you definitely get two different types of individuals. Like one. They'll use it as motivation. Others, they'll use it as like they almost use it as like hate. They like look at people and they think, right, I fucking hate you. And it's quite common in England as well. But you know, they're the people that I'm generally don't have anything to do with anyway. Well, it's a funny thing you mentioned that because I when I know I've lost in the last couple of years just not being competitive. Like I've lost motivation around training on a handful of occasions, and I started to think back of what habits I got into when I was motivated training, like when I first started train. And one of the things I used to do as a, as a kid was I used to watch training videos before I trained. And then, so what I started doing and like, I've been subscribed to the JP app for shit since it started. And I feel like uh, Jordan put me in touch with, uh, Mark Fox, like when the app first kicked off. And so one thing I started doing again was, watching training and one of the 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 rookie season series got me through so many fucking workouts on that app and just watching you train and it was the idea that like it was motivating to see someone else do well it was motivating to see and that was you so i appreciate like i don't know that mindset i appreciate it so much more because that's been such a benefactor to me and my training is literally watching and it's a crazy thing like i mean coming from a powerlifting background 
if I'm squatting whatever the hell I need to squat and it's relatively heavy, it's easy for me to kind of get hype because it's like you either don't and you die or you, you do and you do the rep. But it's like I always struggle bringing that into the bodybuilding realm. But then yeah. like just watching you guys and like you in particular like get hype for everything. Like every set, I was like, oh, like I get it now. And that started to carry into like how motivations and motivation is the wrong word, how like discipline started to carry over outside of the gym and into the business. So like, you know, you probably don't realize it, but like you've had a really profound effect on like my training, my career just by in, like embodying the things that you talk about and maybe talking about the things that you embody is probably a better, better way to frame it. Man, that that really does mean a lot, man. Seriously. Nah, you're like, one of the rare ones, man. Five weeks out. What's that? Making me emotional at five weeks out. Hey, you know, if you cry, it'll pull some of the water out. You'll be real dry on stage. Oh, yeah, man. But I honestly, honestly, like it's 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 the cool the the double edged sword of social media is you you can be drawn into different corners that are highly negative that that don't offer you any value when the other side is you know you come across dudes like you who are out there and it's as real as it gets. And like, I'm really glad you told the stabbing story because if anyone had any idea or any, uh, any doubt about your level of dedication, I think they knew that without the story, but I think that solidifies, solidifies it for them because you know, it's, there are people who say that they would like die for it, but then there's you bleeding all across the fucking gym on a pole day. Like, I think it's, it's a refreshing, even for people who aren't in bodybuilding, to see a level of dedication towards something that 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 scratches that itch. It's uh, I think it's rare, man. And, and we're I, I know me personally, like a huge thank you for for just being you, which is such an odd thing, I'm sure to hear. But uh, the, if the world had more Kubas, man, I think we'd be in a better place. Man, it, that really does mean the world, man. Seriously, it really does. Yeah, man. Hopefully, honestly, hopefully we can do this in person. Uh, whether my side of the pond or yours, man. I really appreciate you t taking the time to to hang, and I appreciate everything that you've done. Sometimes I know when you get stuck in the vacuum, you probably don't. You know, you just see the next task, the next task. But I think you're 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 changing the game for better and for always, man. I, I appreciate everything you do. Means a lot, for that. Really does. Really awesome, does. man. Well, hey, uh, guys, I'll put all of the Instagram stuff on uh, in the show notes. Uh, Kuba, man, thank you so much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Don't don't want to run into your study time and, and into the schedule too much, man. Yes, thank you, brother. I'll talk to you.